Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Stuart Corbridge. I'm the Deputy Director and Provost here at LSE. It's really a great pleasure and an honour to welcome you all to the school today for this LSE and UNESCO International Policy Seminar on Social Development, a UK-Brazil Dialogue. It's a horrible day outside. I gather the traffic is awful too, but you've got a fantastic programme through the rest of the day. I can't be here, unfortunately. I'm tied up in meetings, but we'll come back later on. We've got a fabulous audience. You are a fabulous audience. We've got colleagues from civil society, from academia, staff and students. We have people from government, the private sector, members of NGOs, members of the outreach art movements, many people with a huge amount of expertise to share during the course of the day. I hope you won't mind even so if I single out a, a few people to say a special thank you to for being with us this morning. First of all, uh, two colleagues from the government in Brazil. Uh, Teresa Campello, the Secretary of State for Social Development and the Fight Against Hunger, and Masae Evaristo, a Minister in the Department of Education, who has the brief for Literacy, continuing, Continuous Education and Inclusion. Uh, we're really grateful to you both for being with us today, from coming over from Brazil and so close to the elections as well. Also, I'd like to extend a special welcome to other speakers who are joining us today from Brazil. Uh, think of Luis Roberto Perez Ferreira and Rene Silva dos Santos. And of course, to all the people that are joining us this, after, uh, this morning on the panel. Uh, we're delighted to have with us His Excellency Roberto Jaguaribe, Brazil's ambassador to the UK. I must say also that Roberto has, in his time in London, been a very good friend to the LSE, so I'm particularly pleased that he's with us this morning. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Lala Ben Barker, I think, is ill, but we're lucky that we've been joined by a Deputy Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences at UNESCO, Dandev Bardach, who is two to my left. Also, we have apologies, unfortunately, from Nick Dyer, who I've worked with a lot, who's the Director General of DFID, the Department for International Development here in the UK. But we're delighted that we've been joined by David Hallam, who is the International Relations Director for DFID and has, I think, particular responsibilities for the post-2015 agenda. Let me say, secondly, that uh, we're delighted at LSE to be hosting, once again, a seminar in conjunction with UNESCO. Um, this follows on, and I've already met people here this morning who were here last year, fantastic event that we did together about a year ago, looking at bottom-up social development in some of the favelas in Rio. Uh, this was the seminar on underground sociabilities. It's really very important to LSE that we sponsor and take part in multi-stakeholder research that has real impact and that we do it with partners like UNESCO and indeed DFID. So many thanks to all colleagues who are joining us today from UNESCO. Also, it gives me an opportunity to thank Sandra Jovchilevich, where she's gone, and all her team who've put a tremendous amount of work and I would say affection into organizing this second event. Thank you very much, Sandra, once again. Um, I mentioned briefly DFID as well as UNESCO. The school has been very pleased to work alongside the Department for International Development for some time. Particularly, we host something called the International Growth Center here at LSE. It's in combination with Oxford. And this is an enterprise which really tries to make use of the very best work in development economics and political science and is put in service of countries that DFID works with in Africa and Asia. So it's very nice to join up the dots today, as I believe we're going to do in terms of connecting up, particularly from uh, Latin America to Africa, which is now strongly on the DFID agenda. Uh, we are being joined today by the Executive Director of the IGC, Jonathan Leap, who's in the audience. And I'm hoping later on this afternoon that one of the school's strongest professors, Vernon Henderson, who we recruited from Brown a year ago, who's one of the world's leading experts on urban development, will be joining uh, the audience. He's working on a big World Bank-funded program on urbanization. Lastly, let me just say that uh, I think Sandra has chosen this room because it is her favorite room at LSE. I hope so. It's my favorite room 
at LSE too. Uh, this is the Shaw Library. We think of it really as the founder's room at LSE. Uh, you might know LSE is 120 years old next year, which if you work backwards means that we were founded in 1895. And amongst the founders were George Bernard Shaw, uh, so this room is named in honor of him, and Sidney and Beatrice Webb. And you know, the LSE has always tried to be a university that's a little bit different. I hope from the very beginning that this has been a university committed to diversity and to inclusion uh, in terms of gender, ethnicity, and race. It remains the case that this is the most international of all the world's top global universities. Less than a third of the students, in fact, at LSE are UK students, and we welcome that diversity. And thirdly, this has always been a university that has not considered itself to be an ivory tower. We have, since the very beginning, because we were founded by some of the leading lights of Fabian socialism in this country, been a university that has been committed to making a difference in the world in, in all sorts of ways. I mean, that can be in the private sector, it can be in terms of advising on quantitative easing. The new uh, governor of the, Re of the Reserve Bank system in the US is an LSE alumna. It can be advising Chelsea on which way goalkeepers should dive in penalty shootouts, which is based on the work of one of our Spanish professors here, based on game theory. Uh, we've been heavily committed to work on training of healthcare workers in Zambia, tax reform in Pakistan, both through the IGC and, of course, through Sandra's various projects to working with UNESCO and other partners in terms of learning about social development and learning from Brazil and seeing where we can help transfer knowledge and make a difference. Just before I step down, I might say, and Roberto knows this, that I have a particular and personal interest in Latin America. My partner is uh, Costa Rican. Um, I think she was flying yesterday from San Jose to Miami. She's also a diplomat. And I'm very pleased to say that LSE has now put Latin America very close to the top of our agenda. Um, I'm deputizing today, and I'm happy to do so, for my boss Craig Calhoun, who landed uh, late last night in Delhi. Two weeks' time, Craig will be in Colombia where, of course, the president is uh, an alumnus of LSE. He's been to Brazil already three times since he became the director of the school. He's been to Chile twice and Mexico. And these four countries in particular, Brazil, Mexico, Chile, and Colombia, are major areas of interest for the LSE. We hope very much to do more work there, to get involved with our alumni in those communities, and to have more students from Latin America come to LSE. We will next year announce the formation of a Latin America Center at LSE early in the new year, and this will be part of our new Institute of Global Affairs. So for all sorts of reasons, uh, LSE looks forward to a long and fruitful collaboration with Latin America in general, with students, with alums, with policymakers, with activists. Your seminar today uh, is an exemplar of many of the things that the school wants to do. I hope you have a wonderful day. Welcome again to LSE. Thank you. I'm now going to ask Roberto, His Excellency, to say a few words of welcome as well. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Stuart Corbridge, Deputy Director and Provost at LSE, uh, for hosting this meeting. Thank uh, UNESCO for also co-organizing this event. As the professor said, uh, LSE is a university with a lot of uh, assets. In Brazil, L LSE is perceived as one of the key universities in the world. And there's a very uh, a clear perception that LSE has provided perhaps alternative visions to some of the more traditional issues, more so than perhaps some other traditional British universities, which are obviously also uh, amongst the excellency in this group, limited group of universities in the world. But uh, the tradition that uh, LSE has in Brazil is very strong, and we are increasing the participation of Brazil in LSE. The, the number of students has, has been rising. 
there's now an attempt to create a student group from Brazil in LSE, and uh, we are following this all very closely. We're also very content with the indication that uh, the school is going to create the Latin American Center next year. Uh, I've been in touch with my colleagues from Latin America and some of the people involved, and uh, we're very happy about this development. We all know that London is a very global city, but I like to say usually that there are global and global. London is very global, but not sufficiently Latin global. And I think that providing this addition here will benefit the city as well. I, of course, am very honored and happy to be able to have uh, 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 Minister Teresa Campillo uh, making a statement during this event. As you all know, Brazil, during the past many years, has given special attention to social inclusion. I think of all the measurements that you can have of a success of a country, none is as important as the degree of social inclusion and of harmony that you generate in society. Unfortunately for us, Latin America has been a region afflicted over the centuries by the very high degree of inequality. But over the past decades, this has been one of the regions of the world that has most successfully tackled this very important issue. In the case of Brazil, this is very, very much so. The numbers speak for themselves. They are all well known. But no country, as I said, can be successful with this level of discrimination and inequality. And this is the fundamental conquest and the fundamental priority of the Brazilian society. And uh, the work that has been done, and you will see part of it today, is already well understood, comprehended, and applauded throughout the world. Recently, we, just, we had another important secretary from Brazil doing the housing program in Brazil in another seminar here uh, in the LSE, which was also very important to disseminate the experiences that Brazil has been finding in this area with renewed success year after year. So this is, is for us a fundamental element. We are, of course, very glad to be able to showcase the very positive Brazilian experience, but we're also continuously eager to understand and to improve and to find new mechanisms and methods that can also be utilized in, Bra in Brazil to make sure that we are in, in the right path. And seminars like these are those that can provide us with additional inputs to enrich our experience and to make our process even uh, more effective. So uh, I'd also like to salute, obviously, the, the fellow colleagues here, uh, uh, Professor Dender Bardash from UNESCO, uh, Nick, well, uh, David Hallam, uh, who has come from uh, the Fiji, and to welcome very much also uh, our very own Secretary Makae Varisto, who is going to make uh, participation later on. So thank you. I'm sure this is going to be a wonderful event. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, so our next speaker is indeed Dandev Bardash uh, from UNESCO. So we welcome you. Your Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I am pleased to represent UNESCO in this meeting on behalf of Mrs. Pimbarka, who is the Assistant Director General of UNESCO for Social and Human Sciences. Let me present from the onset the apology of the Assistant Director General, who could not make it to this seminar because of unforeseen circumstances. Allow me to express our appreciation to the government of Brazil, London School of Economics and Political Sciences, LSE, for support to this important event. I would like also to extend a special thanks to all the participants for being here today to exchange views on how to address the challenges of social inclusion in their modern cities. This international policy seminar is a continuation of important dialogue which began two years ago with the launch of the study on underground sociabilities by the 
LDC, and UNESCO. The study was the result of very efficient north-south collaboration spearheaded by the LDC and UNESCO Brasilia office with the support of several Brazilian organizations from the private sector and civil society, such as Itao Cultural Institute, the Itao Social Foundation, afro Irrigate, and Cupa. The project brought together a range of different stakeholders on a subject that is at the center of UNESCO's work to promote sustainable social development. Peace, human rights, and gender equality across development efforts at all levels. Enabling social inclusion and the reintegration of disadvantaged women and men through innovative approaches has been a key component of UNESCO strategy. Through civic engagement, the arts and the sport, as in the context of this project, UNESCO has been empowering the most vulnerable communities, particularly young women and men who suffer the most from various types of discrimination, violence, and exclusion based on gender, ethnic belongings, disability, or age to develop, innovate, and produce positive outcomes. The challenge of translating such outcomes into policy and uh, regulatory frameworks is one, of, one that we will be debating today, both in context of this project and beyond. Supporting policy initiatives of member states pursuing two global development objectives has been the leitmotiv of UNESCO's effort for many years and will gain the importance as we approach the area of new sustainable development goals. Indeed, within the context of post-2015 UN development agenda, which emphasizes the promotion of social inclusion as a means of achieving sustainable development, the re promotion <coughs> The, the, the relevance of UNESCO's knowledge and competencies to promote you know, to the project like this is greater than ever before. Moreover, such experiences showcase the type of input that an organization can provide for the purpose of linking global considerations to local realities. In addition to its important thematic focus, the project and its continuing output is example of bringing community practice with academic research, all with a view to improving innovative and inclusive policy development. This effort lies at the very heart of UNESCO's innovative and inclusive policy development. Uh, <coughs> UNESCO's Intergovernmental Science Program for the Management of Social Transformation, most that aims at the supporting sustainable and efficient policy dialogue among the academy, policymakers, and practitioners. While the program focuses on building efficient bridge, bridges between research, policy, and practice, it also promotes a culture of evidence-informed policy making, nationally, regionally, and internationally. As the only UNESCO program that fosters and promotes social science research, most is placed in key position in overall promotion of UNESCO's goal. With this in mind, social and human sciences sector at UNESCO, through the most program and the work of its intergovernmental council, remains ready to collaborate with the LSE and all partners involved in this study to ensure that its findings achieve their maximum impact. It is important that the results of the study are channeled to and advocated with decision makers at both national and local levels in countries, municipalities, or communities that present decision makers at both national uh, communities that present similar context to one of Rio. At the same time, it would be crucial to explore possibilities for refl replicating the experience in other countries and different continents, as well as for identifying 
other opportunities for innovative and locally driven multi-stakeholder initiatives. Today's seminar is an example of the type of dialogue that is needed on how ground-level experience of social development intersect with governments and policymakers in shaping processes of policy design and implementation. We welcome DFIT's participation as it adds value to this dialogue and contributes to facilitating the exchange of knowledge on social inclusion and poverty reduction with developing countries. We count on your support to help us to expand the scope of dynamic experience and attract many more interested actors from the North and the South. In the same spirit, we are particularly encouraged by the long-standing commitment of the government of Brazil towards the African region, which is the global priority for our organization. This is also of utmost importance for Africa Department of UNESCO, which is headed by Mrs. Bimbarka. In initiatives such as purchase from Africans for Africa, the, one, the ones within the framework of community of Portuguese-speaking countries and the World Without Poverty internet-based platform could serve as a model for follow-up to the underground, underground sociabilities project. We hope that we will have the government on the board, of, board in our endeavors. As an example of the project that not only seeks to better understand the parameters of how people seek inclusion, but also prioritizes inclusive principles in its own design. The Underground Sociabilities Project is an important illustration of the type of research that is needed to achieve the ambitious development goals of the next 15 years. The project is evidence of enormous added value of creating partnership across academia, non-profit organizations, and private sectors. Without the input of NGO partners, afro iraqi and Coupa, it would have been impossible to identify and map the voices of Pavela communities and their interactions with grassroots projects. Similarly, without the input of our private sector partners, it would not have been possible to uncover the complex institutional relationships which exist between the Pavelas and the rest of the city. And finally, without the direction of LSE, the components of the project would not have connected to produce such thorough and cohesive findings. The project shows us that by working together, we can help translate the voices of excluded women and men, girls and boys, into a discourse which shapes the direction of more effective public policy in the future. As we did, <coughs> as with the design of the project, its findings also contain important transferable lessons for achieving socially inclusive development. We learned that underground sociabilities as a response to social exclusion can, in many cases, be seen as an example of positive citizenship, providing the basis for growth of social capital in innovative social technology. We learned that efficacy of grassroots movements, such as afro iraqi in Kufa, derives from the culture, identity, and wisdom of communities of which they are part, part of. We also learned that the development of successful inclusive policy necessitates the full participation of its intended beneficiary beneficiaries, as well as broad consultation with government actors, NGOs, and private sectors. The study makes also the case for stronger investments in girls' education, as well as therefore the development of male role models with a view to reshaping the position of fathers and other male caretakers. This is very much in line with UNESCO's other global priority on gender equality. These are all lessons that have immense transferability beyond the geographic and thematic scope of the project. As a final word, I cannot 
but congratulate the government of Brazil, as well as the initiators of this study, LEC, and the office in Brazil, our office in Brazil, and all those who supported it and continue to contribute to the dialogue around its output. It is up to all of us working together to ensure that this study is properly translated into action. And I look forward to discussing today how we can continue to use the, its findings to improve public policies for social inclusion at all levels. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dendev. Uh, we're very grateful to you for representing UNESCO and being with us this morning. We send our best wishes to uh, Dr. Ben Barker. Uh, the final speaker in this session, in terms of welcome, before we hand over to Sandra, is David Hallam uh, from DFID. So, David, we look forward to hearing from you. I've never felt more self-conscious that I'm the fourth man in a row to speak to you, but we're lucky that the, the main event of the morning is going to be a woman to, to help to redress the balance. Minister Campello, Ambassador Jagaribe, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here today to say a few words and personally and warmly welcome Minister Teresa Campello, Brazil's Minister of Social Development. For anyone interested in poverty reduction, Brazil stands out as a beacon. 36 million people lifted out of poverty over the last 10 years. Malnutrition of children under two halved. A 10% reduction, and the ambassador and the professor touched on this, a 10% reduction in inequality in the last 12 years, in contrast to many countries around the world. I could go on, but the statistics add up into an unparalleled success story of reducing poverty and inequality and continuing to grow economically. Building on these achievements, Minister Campello's department is now leading the charge not just to reduce, but to eradicate extreme poverty. Through the Brazil Without Extreme Poverty Programme, Brazil Sem Miseria, which was launched in 2011, the aim is to lift a further 15 million people out of extreme poverty at a cost of approximately 0.5% of GDP. And we should not underestimate this challenge. Those living in extreme poverty are often chronically ill, physically hard to reach, marginalized from society, and vulnerable to shocks. They are, in the words of Brack, those people who have nothing and are nothing. Under the stewardship of Minister Campello's department, all the indicators suggest that Brazil has once again done remarkably well, more than halving extreme poverty since 2001. A tremendous achievement. As DFID's Director for International Relations and the UK's envoy for the post-2015 development goals, it's a source of great pride for me that DFID has been a close partner of the Ministry of Social Development since its inception, providing technical inputs in support of the development of the hugely successful and well-known Bolsa Familia programme and promoting the programme's participation in international outreach. Following the end of the UK's bilateral programme with Brazil, our partnership has continued with DFID now partnering with the Ministry to share its lessons and expertise with several countries in Africa, such as, for example, supporting the design and implementation of Ghana's national cash transfer programme. As the Professor mentioned, I have particular responsibility as UK envoy for the post-2015 development goals, and I hope you'll forgive me speaking a little bit about that. And Minister, it's because of our long and deep partnership with your ministry in mind that I'd like to reaffirm our commitment to working jointly with Brazil towards a set of concise, compelling, inspiring, and implementable, sustainable development goals which will succeed the MDGs. Brazil, sem miseria, has at its heart the challenge of leaving nobody behind. And the UK and Brazil share many common priorities for the next goals, including on food and nutrition, security, gender equality, and education. But there is more work to do. We have an initial proposal on the table, but we need to refine and improve the targets. We need to further develop and clarify the means of implementation. And because the sustainable development agenda is so much more difficult and challenging than the Millennium Development Goals, which focus simply on poverty, 
we have the challenge to produce an agenda that will inspire people and citizens around the world, as well as the politicians they represent, and will be implementable in its entirety, because only that way will we have the accountability that the next agenda really needs. And lastly, how we pay for implementation of these goals is vitally important. I'm proud that the UK has met its commitment to reach 0.7% of GNI for official development assistance, and we're working to encourage other developed countries who can afford it to meet their commitments. That said, aid is not enough. The resources to implement the next goals will need to include all possible sources of finance. And we need to recognize that the policy and institutional arrangements behind those goals will be essential for the sustainable development goals to be a success. We have a fascinating day ahead. And I'm pleased that DFID will be active participants through my colleagues Paul and Indranil. And Minister, once again, it's been my great pleasure to welcome you here to congratulate you for your Ministry's remarkable success in reducing poverty and to express my hope that we continue to build on the historic relationship between DFID and your Ministry in the years to come. Welcome. Thank you, David. Thanks all of our colleagues here at the front. I'm now going to give up my place at the front and uh, stand at the back before I have to leave, but not before I do something that I'm really looking forward to doing, which is to introduce our next speaker, who will speak on the theme of how can the UK and Brazil learn from each other. And I'm talking, of course, about uh, Professor Sandra Jobchilovic. Uh, Sandra is not only an outstanding scholar, a wonderful administrator in terms of working with her team to put on today's event. She's also one of the warmest and nicest people in the LSE, which I hope is a warm and nice institution itself. Um, so, Sandra, it gives me very great pleasure to ask you to come to the front and to really introduce uh, today's proceedings. And thank you for everything that you've done on behalf of LSE and UNESCO in putting this together. <laughs> thank you. I said I wouldn't think about it. Well, uh, thank you to Stuart. Thank you. A very warm welcome and thank you um, to all of you for being here today. Um, and a very special welcome uh, and thank you to our partners, UNESCO and our Brazilian speakers who found time out of a very busy uh, agenda to be with us today. Um, thank you to my colleagues at LSC to my colleagues and students in the Department of Social Psychology, and a very special thank you to Dr. Jacqueline Prego Hernandez, whose work and dedication made the seminar possible, really. Uh, it's, uh, it warms my heart to see Brazil here at the LSC. It warms my heart to see the achievements uh, of social, social development in Brazil here at the LSC, and it warms my heart to see the school as usual and as always, as long as it's history, open to the challenges of the world. So why a UK-Brazil dialogue? What can Brazil and the UK teach each other in terms of social development? In the UK, there is a clear interest in absorbing lessons and experiences that Brazil can offer as one of the rising economies and policies of the global south. And in Brazil, and that's true, certainly for Brazilians of my generation, uh, there has always been interest in the achievements of the British public sphere, in the achievements of its policy making, its rich and long history of developing, implementing, and evaluating policy for social development. Let us remember that the welfare state was born right here in this old building of LSE. And that's why this room is my favorite room in the school. The picture of our founders is behind our screen, so you cannot see it, but that's where they used to come and meet and discuss how they were going to change the world. Our seminar today follows on these traditions and builds on the findings and recommendations of underground sociability as a multi-stakeholder research partnership that mapped life trajectories 
and his strategies of bottom-up social development in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro. Similar research was later conducted in the UK, examining the role and model of work of Kids Company, a major UK charity dedicated to working with the most vulnerable children in the UK. Key findings from this program of research show that, first, individual and social factors interact to shape choice in decision-making in the roots of socialization. Our findings show decisively, and indeed add to an increasing body of evidence in psychology and in the behavioral sciences that social context shapes individual outcomes. Individual trajectories are not something individuals decide alone. And locating the causes of poverty and marginalization in the poor and the excluded is profoundly misguided. The evidence from a wide range of disciplines, from the social sciences to social and neuropsychology, shows that contexts can enable or disable life trajectories. In face of this evidence, social policy matters. It is essential and it builds what is needed. Uh, it, it's essential in building supportive environments and can change lives to the better. The second key finding of our research is that psychosocial scaffoldings, traditionally seen as the provision of nuclear families, can be provided by a variety of social institutions and NGOs. Psychosocial scaffoldings are defined as actions and structures of support that sustain the human self as a force for individual and social integration. We found that the presence or absence of psychosocial scaffoldings is the main predictor of behavioral outcomes in the favelas of Rio. The NGOs we studied provide psychosocial scaffoldings. They work as parents by proxy, assisting families, educating and supporting girls and women, developing positive identification, strengthening male role models and the figure of the father, and pushing the statutory sector into action. They are crucial and innovative voice of civil society, combining a deep connection with their communities of origin, a daring and unconventional capacity for creating programs for social development, and a desire to act politically in the public sphere, well exemplified by the words I heard back in 2010 from Nega Giza, who is here with us today. We want to be protagonists. We want to change discrimination into charisma. We are a political act, a political force in society. Point three, and it's straight from this, bottom-up organizations and social movements offer lessons and directions worth paying attention to. Our research found that they play a unique role in social development and should be active partners in addressing and implementing social policies. Finally, the study of underground, of behavioral uh, outcomes in contexts of deprivation shows that subterranean sociabilities are mobile and hygienic. The study of human development under conditions of deprivation shows first that there is resilience and human capability in territories of exclusion, and this needs to be understood and tapped into. And second, when all else goes wrong, lives can be changed by an ethics of care and by social policy. People can and do change their lives in enabling environments. Since the realization of this research, LSE and UNESCO have been working together on a series of activities and international developments, that events that focus on disseminating these findings and putting emphasis on the role played by the bottom up in developing policy and transforming life trajectories in territories of exclusion. Some of you will have seen our website and our blog, Favelas at LSC, which is curated by Dr. Prego Hernandez, an open platform for communicating and discussing 
these experiences of bottom-up social development. Last May, we were in Rio discussing and devolving research findings with our partners, Afrareg and Kufa. And in 2013, we co-hosted a conference here in the UK with Kids Company to launch a research on their model of work in the UK. Integral to our aims is to increase the exposure and the power to influence of the grassroots agencies we have studied because we are convinced that incorporating their experiences and lessons produces smart policy and reduces changes of failure. Using innovative and situated methodologies that draw on identity and local knowledge, attention to the individual level and unconventional partnerships, these grassroots organizations and charities offer us insight, access to difficult to reach populations, and a track record of efficient delivery. They also change the stigma and wider social representations of people living in poverty and experiencing marginalization. The generative power of this bottom-up movements and NGOs actually comes out of the communities of which they are part and represent. It's a power that draws its efficacy from the social capital and the situated wisdom of people who must live a difficult life, face poverty and violence, and yet remain resilient and hopeful about themselves, their communities, and their future. Unpacking this and other similar experiences is key to our conversation today and central to understanding what is unique about Brazilian development, the limits and possibilities of its transferability to other contexts in the global south, and why not in the global north as well. The capacity of the Brazilian state to absorb the experiences and lessons of grassroots organizations may explain a key characteristic of the Brazilian model, namely the link between economic and social development as combined processes of the political institutional sphere and civil society. The social capital of Brazil and its capacity for successful social development are not being produced solely in a top-down manner by technocrats, experts, and politicians alone. Rather, it is being forged by multiple actors in the collaborations, in the dialogues, and partnerships, sometimes very difficult partnerships of the democratic public sphere. Levels of association and activism, as well as unconventional and novel partnerships between different, at times historically opposed social actors, are producing a bottom-up push that intersects with a determined political will to create a vision of economic growth that is not separated from citizenship and from the self-esteem of historically marginalized and excluded populations. It is this combination between the macro and the micro, the bottom-up and the top-down, that is renewing marginalized identities and pushing new protagonists into real arenas of decision-making. Brazil's hot climate for social policy, to use an expression uh, of LSC Center uh, adopted here by my colleagues at the LSC Center for the Analysis of Social Exclusion, goes hand in hand with its hot climate for civic participation, a development that should be seen as positive and expressive of the vitality of the Brazilian public sphere and its wide range of new social actors. This may well contrast with the cold climate we observe today in the global north, both for policy and for civic participation. It is a contrast that can take us into a related and difficult reflection of a key dilemma of this early 21st century, both in the global south and in the global north how to overcome the dichotomy between a just society that is driven by an ethics of care and attention to the human and a society dedicated purely to economic growth. Against this dichotomy, the Brazilian model of inclusive growth remains a challenging and inspiring possibility. Our seminar today, as our other events before, bring together multiple and at times contradictory voices from Brazil and the UK 
to discuss these issues. We are grateful to Secretary of State Teresa Campello for having accepted our invitation to be here today and face this discussion. Throughout this work, we have relied and continue to rely on Amartya Sen's conception of development as freedom, emphasizing the social and psychological capacity of multiple agents to produce solutions to the urgent and morally devastating conditions of deprivation that is still characterize so much of our shared human life. I very much hope that our discussion today will contribute to the reflection and to the knowledge base that supports human-centered development as the best solution for the inequalities of our global age. Thank you very much.